Damn, is your beard like actually coming in full? Yeah. Look at that. It's this thing. Count, count us in. You're live. Hi, hey, everyone. Con- hey, hey, hey. Welcome to the virtual <laughs> Life Academy. Good to see everybody. Not a great view there, Scooter Man. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to turn that down. Scott, Scott must have uh, dropped his, his uh, laptop in his lap. <laughs> we can't hear you, Scooter. You're still muted. <laughs> but I'm sure what you said was funny. <laughs> I hope so. I'm back. Oh, and he's loud. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Is the camera fuzzy? I was putting jack stands behind my iPad. It's up on cinder blocks. (laughs) That's what Sammy does. That's what Sammy does. to the bad neighborhood, huh? Well, depends where you park it. (laughs) Right on. Okay. So, hey, how's everybody doing on this Friday? Man, I'm great. Okay. Look, Look at the sun in my background. You know? Look at the water in mine. It's real, it's yeah. real echoey, LT, when, if you're out in the woods. It's very echoey. Yeah. Can you hear that? Well, it's all the Can you hear me now? and the uh, growing stuff. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. Scott, where are you at? Uh, He's Lake in Champlain. the command chair again. <laughs> I mean the foyer. Make it so, number one. Wait, 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 wait. Is that the command chair, Scott? Uh, no. No, this oh, is just okay. the wing back. Technically, this is our library because here's all the books, and there's a lamp back there, and there's a wing back chair, and oh. you can just kind of read and figure out how to use a tarp or a compass oh. or survive. Or yeah, your survival stuff. book. Right. I know. Gotcha. I know. Yeah. Hey, I noticed your survival books haven't changed. Does that mean you haven't looked at them or moved? <laughs> hey, hey, I've read all these books twice. Just for relax. Twice. The two times. Right just on. the twice. <laughs> Both times in the bathroom. Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, uh, yeah. I do. That's, yeah, that's good. That's okay. Right on. Good, good, good. I can't hear you, so. Hey. I don't care. Oh, about yeah, you. yeah. That's a right good one. Rover, baby. That's a good one. Does anyone have Nicole's newest book? I, no, I, but... I flipped through it, but <laughs> I have one? not purchased it. I no, want to get it. I was telling Elaine that I wanted to get that, too. Yeah, I think okay. I might order it from Amazon today. I got this. Got Man, that one. Look at you! Got all your bushcraft stuff all around, right? Go. I'm ready to bushcraft in my mind he was right a here bush yeah. from the craft hero. <laughs> so as, as you can, as you can see, I'm getting ready to uh, bushcraft. Get well, lead a trail ride, apparently. Yeah. If, if, he, if, if only he would t- turn off his headlights. Wait! Look at uh, that clear in the back there. There's a tan truck. There, I wonder where that thing's at now. Uh, it's it's on the other side of the country. Yeah, right Washington I State. It, I, I think it lives up northwest. Yeah. Yep. Scooter turned it loose, and now it fends for itself in the wild. Oh, Sam, Sam, would you please turn your headlights off for filming? Oh, yes, Sam. Jeez, jeez, that's rude. Jeez. It's rude, for safety. Sam. Yeah, that way you can tell I'm behind you. Look at Mike just a, magically appeared with a drink in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. It's like, oh, it's cool. yeah, right. it's good. Hey, he said, this is exact words. Oh, he says to me, too. he said to me, look, my truck's on a trailer. You guys can't make fun of me because it's not running. Now, hmm. yes, where, yes, we can. Exactly <laughs> what I said. <laughs> sure we can. Yeah, where right. in the world? Why, yes, we can. Just watch. <laughs> 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 hey, but anyway, the sun came out. <clears throat> How cool was that? Right on, man. For are real you or your picture? <laughs> Look, see my glasses. It's, it's pretty cloudy here. I mean, there's some sun, but yeah. yeah the little... sun did come out a little bit. I have sun. All right. Over there. You do. Yeah. So do yeah, I. You see how bright it is back here? And the beautiful water. Mm-hmm. Careful, Sam. Don't fall in. Hey, be careful. You could drown. I'll be fine. I'm in the kayak. Oh, okay. <laughs> no Sweet. life jacket. You're going to get a ticket oh, from the uh, game warden. He's got his buff on. He's all right. Yeah, see this? This will keep me afloat. Yeah. Ah. Uh, all right. So, hey, what do you guys want to talk about today? Last weekend, we were talking about some grinding, <clears throat> some different things. Um, and I know we covered sharpening. I was thinking we should talk some Kydex. Actually, a little bit of Kydex. So, let's yeah. Sam, let Sam do some of the leadoff talk. That doesn't sound like Yeah, that. Sam. Ready, go. Sam, I, I'm a I'm a lightweight backpacker. 
Not for real, but I'm just <laughs> long time listener, first time caller. You're neither lightweight nor a backpacker. Wow. He's a lot lighter than you, wow. Mike. That hey, Mike. Nice. Mike, does that truck run? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's what nope. I <laughs> ran when parked. Ran when parked. <laughs> so I doesn't I'm lo- count. I am looking for a rig to carry inverted on my backpack. What, what kind of kayak would I? What would I kind of be looking for? Let's say for something in the size of a great plainsman. The upside uh, down kind. For the upside down kind, I'd probably go with a foldover. Taco True. style. Yeah, Maybe sorry, I've been off. watching a lot of SpongeBob. So. Molly clip. Which kind? Of, oh, the ulti clip. Yep. You know, I actually have one of those right here. We showed one last week, I think. Is it right there in the front of the Jeep? I think I see it. Uh, I. Can you turn your headlights on high so I can see? Yeah, just give me one second. Let me click them on. Yeah. Oh, much better. Thing. There you go. Very good. Yeah, there you go. Nice. That, that clip <clears throat> on the Tidex rig is yeah. pretty darn sweet. Actually, right? that's, yeah. that style, well, with a slide lock, yeah. that style, taco. Yeah. Uh, we have a Even question. I'm pretty sure Sam said uh, a tech lock, not an ulti clip. I said tech lock or. or, or. Ah, okay, cool. Got it. All right, oh, Sam. Yes. Sam, stay, stay in focus, would you? Stay, hey, focus now. I have a question water. from Alan Go Smith. Ahead, he yeah. said, do you all have different jobs in the shop specialties, or do you follow a knife through from glue to sharpening? That is a great question. Okay, and I, I'll start off. We probably all can do something start to finish, for sure. Um, but we do have we'll say specialties. There are some of us that are better at doing these other things than we are at, at, at some things. Um, but we can probably all do everything. And, you know, we have done stuff. Uh, Mike, I think you would be, Mike is more of the tech guy. He does know how to do a a fair amount of stuff, but I don't know that he knows how to do every single thing. I think the rest of us can all do everything. I've done it all at least once in my life, but that's about it. But so, so, I mean, you could technically make a knife. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yes, especially like when we first started out, when it was me by myself, naturally, I did everything but the stuff that Elaine did, which was the shipping and, and going to the shows with me. And then when Scott came on board, we kind of did a, a handoff back and forth. I think even then we were both doing just about everything at some point, right, in the basement. We really didn't. Eventually, split. yeah. We didn't really split off into like our super specialties till we got over here, I think, because we would always touch on all the stuff in the basement. Like one day, it, 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 it always would, moved around. Yeah, I mean, one day he'd go out and do kydex, and then one yeah. the, one day the next week I'd be doing kydex, and same thing with sharpening and building. I don't remember that part? Which part? When you were out doing the kydex. <laughs> oh, Scott, you really shouldn't. Shooter. Wait a minute. You really shouldn't talk about him doing kydex because I've seen some of the sheets you've done, bud. Hey. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, no. I got it. I got it. I invented the slide lock. Yeah, no. I don't really care. <laughs> no, anyway, he's, he's right. We would all bounce around, and, and some days we would do different stuff. But yes, eventually we sort of fell into our niche market. Right. So, so this right now is a slide lock, by the way. Yeah, that's a slide lock. <laughs> Correct. Scott did not create, but whatever. <laughs> See it? No, it but slides. it's cool. That is, as far as knife industry stuff, there's all kind of really cool innovations. That's got to be right up there. That's a very good idea. Yeah, I dig it. Pretty, pretty happy about that one. Yeah. So, so to get back to well, who was it, Mikey? I'm sorry. Uh, Al- Alan. Alan Stone Smith. Alan Smith. Yeah. Sorry. Alan, to, to get back to your question, I, I, I know I get squirreled easy. Just check with my wife. Uh, right now, the way the shop has, shop has been set up for the most part, because we've had 12 people that work with the company, and each one of us, we have sections. We have what we, we consider the steel section. We have what we consider the build section. And then the finish sharpening section kind of going in there. But over the years, we have now a laser section, a shop bot where we do some handles and fire steel heads. Heat treat. Uh, heat treat section. That's Kydex. Awesome. Kydex section. Big, that's kind of Kydex, awesome. yep. So, yep. yes, we can all do those things, but we also do specialize in some things. Uh, like one of the things that's up, my section up here takes care of the roughing. 
So I kind of set the size and the shape of most handles that go through the shop. And then at that point, they would go into Nick's section where they would get final finished. And depending on what they, they could get mustarded, uh, they could get scotch brighted, they could get polished, they could get mountain finished, they could get twist finished, whatever. And then depending on where we're at, sometimes they would go to Scott's section and Scott would take care of the sharpening and heading them up to the cleaning table. Or if there's other stuff going on, if he's doing laser work, and then Nick or Adam would usually do the sharpening at that point. As far as building goes, usually that's a Mikey thing. Mikey has a team of people that uh, works on the build side that he oversees. And he also is our IT guy, so he spends some of the time doing the, uh, when Scott and I screw up a website or a cloud house or something like that, Mike goes and fixes it. He's like our IT fixer guy. He's also the shop guy who builds stuff out of level, or I mean, he builds stuff for the shop. Out of oh, you mean like on the diagonal line thing? Uh, the out of plumb. Oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about yeah. now. So, no, he takes care of a lot of the shop maintenance. Like, if we have a machine go down, uh, he'll do the wiring and stuff on that most of the time. Um, <laughs> Nick's dad, George, does some of it, though. Like, if we got bearings to replace. Uh, again, falling around to that. Sammy takes care of uh, a lot of the stuff on the front side of things. So, the grinds and uh, Kydex, for sure. He does, you know, rough grinds, finish grinds. Now, in the past, Nick and I have also jumped in on the, the front end side doing the rough grinds doing the finished grinding, you know, whatever, or just drilling holes sometimes, you know, whenever we're backed up. Scott does a lot of the specialty stuff, like if we're getting in a situation where you've got to have split bolsters and all that, and then um, takes care of all the Mike Pardos. And all that. <coughs> now, uh, that's, that's just in general, but now I'll let you guys talk about it specialty. So let's just start right at the front. Usually... If we get some blanks back from water jet, or if we're going to cut them in-house, the first place they got to go is what we call the steel section. And that's where Sammy, most of the time, will take over, or at least hand stuff off to everyone else. Yes, that's true. Most of the time. Hey, did yeah. you see that Did you see that deer jump right there between our trucks? Did you see that? Uh, yeah, I saw the headlights go darker just for a second. Yeah, so just for a second. I'm okay. sure something jumped in front of there. Oh, wait, the hounds. Yeah, oh. see that? We have wild dogs in this part of the uh, library. He, he, sm he smelled it. you got all them survival books. Well, he smelled that deer. Yeah. yeah. I think right, right now he's smelling breakfast or something. Right on. He likes bacon, too. All right, Sammy, take over, bud. Uh, I, well, I don't know how you want me to do this. Pull in your fishing line and just kind of like, okay, so now pieces, you know, water jet piece. So comes, or after a, it comes back from water jet. Or, or a hand cut piece kind of gets to you. No. Or, or a hand cut piece. Are we saying it's already cut? Let's go with it's already cut. So if I get it back from water jet or it's already cut, uh, it's got to be steel coated. First thing, way it doesn't get mixed up and we know what steel it is when it goes to heat treat. Right on. And then it will be drilled and Mike always is real good at making sure we drill the right holes. Uh, they can vary from time to time. Um, after they're drilled, either you or I tend to tail them, make sure the tails are nice and flat. And, now, uh, now, now, tailing, yeah, because we know what tailing means because we say it. But what's tailing? Where you make I got the it. tail of the knife flat? I don't have anything to. I got it. So that's the part of the knife oh. where the actual scales fit yeah. along there. So the we're of the knife under the scales. From here to here, basically, we're running that on a 36 grit. That's what we consider tailing. And we're flattening that piece of steel so that the handles sit nice and flush. And, and also making little grooves for the glue. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. The 36 grit gives. Yeah. So if you microscope grip 36 it. grip, they look like this. Right. Yeah. All right, Sam, pull your fishing line in, continue. Okay, after the tailing, they'll be profiled. You need to, Which means what? <laughs> you need to show that, too. I, oh, sorry. I don't have anything laying here. I'm sorry. Nick, you don't have a blank. I guess I'll do it. <laughs> okay, so profiling, let's say if this was a hand cut or even if it's water jet, we have to go around here and get that final shape. So mm -hmm. that is what's profiling going around here. And generally, after that, um, uh, go ahead, Sam. No, line. Bear. After the profile, they get scribed on the blade. We put two lines down the center of it. So when we grind it, the center of the edge, where the center of the edge is at. 
Yep. And the top a little bit for distal taper. Yep. Now, now the reason we scribe the top is for what, Sam? Uh, to see if the tip's in the middle. Yeah. So that, that is to make sure that when we are grinding, no. because, because well, the other thing the you edge. have to remember is when we're grinding, we're grinding with the edge up. So we can't see this bottom side or the bottom face of this. So what he's saying is that scribe line not only goes here, but it goes up the back side. So that when we get done grinding and we look down this knife like so, like so, we're looking down the point of that, we can see that the two scribe lines and we can make sure that that point is in the center of that knife as we're grinding it. And we can adjust our pressure left to right to bring it to center if it's off. All right, Sammy, keep going. Right. Uh, next step after that would be stamping. So if it's a flat grinder or convex, it gets the house stamp. If it's a Scandi or a Sabre, it gets a signature stamp. And a handful of stuff doesn't get a stamp at all. They get lasered after heat treat. Right on. After they're stamped, we'll 120 the flats, where the the, the front portion of the knife. <coughs> you, you're going to show that, or am I going to continue? Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, just, Hold it up, Vanna. Since, Jeez. since, I, since I am your <laughs> visual, that's great. Oh, there are no vowels left, Sam. I'm sorry. Nick, would you take over? Okay. So sure. he, he's talking about going down here. So now is this after rough grind, right? Or, uh, no, before, before rough grind. Before. So, this, so what happens uh, basically is the stamp is moving metal. It doesn't remove anything. It's not going in there and cutting it away. All the stamp is is actually pressing in there. So that metal has to move somewhere. And it usually moves by bumping up on each side of the leather letters on the, sure. le on the side that is stamped but also by pushing out the back. And believe it or not, even though that that's on a hardened piece of steel, we still get push out, push through, bubble. Well, it's not hardened when we stamp it, but yes. Well, I mean the block that it's sitting on. Right. So piece. think about it like a dent in a car. You know, how it kind of has a dip in it there. Yep. Same kind of idea. So then that's why you The saying, metal is displaced on the back. Yes. There's Scooter with the proper word. <laughs> Nomenclature. Nomenclature and grammar police. It's all, right. all them books he's got there. That's right. <laughs> he's, he's well read. <laughs> you know, so so um, that's what we call fronting. Right, Michael? Or Samuel? Yeah. Yes. Samuel. Samuel. Oh, no, so, that's oh. 120. 120. Okay. I'm fronting, Mike will talk about soon. I'm, Mike will talk about that. I'm, I'm out of my thing here. All right, Sam, keep going, because you're doing so good. <laughs> After their 120, then they will get rough ground. Um, so a Scandi just gets a quick 36 grit. And then uh, the Sabres and the Flats will go from a 36 through an 80 up to a 120. Now that's the actual bevels getting ground in. So yep. this is when it starts to go from a piece of metal like this down to something that has an edge. Right, this one happens to be a saber right there, as you can see it. So that's what he's talking about here. Actually, this has not been final ground. This is still in um, feed blast. So this is exactly what he's talking about to this point. This is heat treated and just be, this color is from bead blasting it after heat treat to get the color off of the steel. I see the Bryans are in the house. Rogers and Marinin, yeah. There they are. Oh, Larry's on. What's up, brother Larry? I hope everything's all good with you up there in New York. Yo. Hi, Larry. Yeah. Good deal. Okay, Sammy, was that where are we at? Uh, after they get ground, they'll go to heat treat. Right on. Ta da. And then, then Nick, you want to take over heat treat? Sure. Now, now batch work, we do. Hold on, Nick. <laughs> Talk. Wait. <laughs> Go, uh, stop, say something, stop! <laughs> I, I deserve that because I was going to go, wait, but there's more. Okay, you go. Okay, you do what I was, okay, wait. Is it, you do Why are you going invisible? This is, this is very disturbing. Okay, you do. You're like turning into Sasquatch. The grass is like creeping over hey, you, bud. Hey, that's, that's how bad he wants to be in that Jeep right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so okay. you, you say what I was going to say. Uh, okay. So as far as I could tell, what you were going to say had something to do with batches of steel. 
right. meaning that depending on types of steel, we sort it by batches for heat treat. Now, whether we send our heat treat out for a large scale batch, which goes up to Meadville, Pennsylvania, uh, then uh, how many pieces is the minimum, Sam? Is it a, well, uh, it's a lot. Let's just say so that. It's yeah. 100. Or yeah. So then um, all the O1 will go together, all the A2 will go together, 3V, so on and so forth, so that it all runs through the same process. Because like we talked about last time, every steel has its own recipe to get it to the particular hardness that we want. If I'm running heat treat or someone else is running heat treat in-house downstairs, we do the same thing. We just organize it by type. So all the A2 goes together, all the O1 goes together, all the D2 goes together, and then I'll run those through accordingly or whoever is doing it will. Um, we have a cookbook which lists off all the different uh, heat treating recipes. So how long it, it sits at what particular temperature and how it gets quenched or what it, you know, what it process it goes through, whatever that might be. Some steels are air quenching. Some are oil quenching. Um, it all depends on what you're working with. So we'll harden the steel first, which means we heat it up to a critical temperature and then cool it down. That's quenching. Then we'll temper the steel, which means taking that, hardened piece of steel and bringing the rock well back down to a lower number by heating it up again, but in a little bit different way. And it, again, it all depends on what kind of steel you're working with determines how you do this. But we always target that one particular rock well range, 57 to 59. So you to get it there. Yes, Sasquatch. <laughs> I, I have a question. Go uh, ahead. Although all the end result is like 59 to 61, you can't do them the same. Is that correct? I mean, that's... I'm sorry. Say that again, please. So, so our end result doesn't matter what the steel is. We shoot for a 59 to 61. However, correct. to get there, yeah, that's depending not, that's not on right. the... that's wrong. 57 to 59, okay. not 59 oh. to 61. I don't. What the heck am I saying? I don't know. I don't know, but <laughs> that's that other nice company you work at. All that well, fresh air is starting to affect your brain. See what happens when you give me a month off. <laughs> okay, you, now you're right. I forget no, my there. numbers. I, sw I have no idea why those two numbers came out of my head. I, well, I, maybe I, maybe one day we'll work with a steel <laughs> where we do target that range. Well, oh, the plus okay. side, it sounded weird every time you said it. Okay. Because <laughs> well, you said it five times. I, you I, guys I, aren't helping him. Leave him alone. <laughs> stop helping. Okay, so let me try it one more time. So okay. We, although uh, at the, the end, it does not matter what the steel is that we're using, right. the result of it being... 57 to 59. Right. That's what we should point. Go, yes. Okay. So, However, you can't just cook them all. I mean, that's kind of what I wanted you to explain to everybody. You couldn't just throw them all in the oven just because we're shooting for 57 to 59 each steel. Right. Time. Well, like yeah. I was saying, it depends on the steel. Some steels will get that end result through one process, and some steels will get it through a different process. You can put certain steels together. They will yeah. harden at the same or through the same process. Again, I always come back to the analogy of baking because it makes so much sense. So you want a certain kind of bread, you break at a certain temperature for a certain you know length of time, and then you pull it out of the oven. Same kind of process applies to steel. Uh, certain steels you have to heat up very hot. We're talking almost two thousand degrees or more. And then bring down to a room temperature very, very quickly. You have to quench them very fast, but still in the air. There's a whole myriad of different ways to quench steel, too. You can use oil or air, like I was saying. Those are the two primary types. But you can also do it with other things, like aluminum plates. So if you ever see a knife maker quenching a knife by taking it out of a hot oven and putting it between two aluminum plates, either in a vise or a press... That's the same as air quenching or gives you a very, very similar result. But the benefit of that is that it helps keep the steel straight because it's applying even pressure and that aluminum is heat sinking very, very quickly. So you're getting really great you know, control over what you're working on. So that's heat treating Correct. and tempering a little bit. Uh, there's a lot more to it. It's a pretty deep well of stuff. But yes, so that's heat treating. Then... Uh, almost invariably, whether you use those plates or not, 
if you do ten knives, I guarantee at least one of them will probably be bent. And that's just because of what's in the steel and, you know, it's different composition features. So, or maybe it laid in the oven a certain way, or maybe it got quenched a certain way, whatever. You, there's too many variables to really control all of it. So you always end up with a little bit of a bend in something. So to fix that, what we do is we actually heat them up with an oxygen acetylene torch uh, in such a way so that it doesn't damage the temper, um, but we're able to soften the steel a little bit and flex it to whatever side we need to move it to. Mm -hmm. you know, relax the metal a little bit so you can push and pull on it and get it where it needs to be so you have a nice straight knife at the end. So that's heat treating and straightening. Yeah. Which, which you, uh, yeah, which we uh, do a lot of it in house, and then we, the batch work goes to Peters. We've known Brad for a number of years, and Brad has been doing our heat treat forever, so that's always been a good thing too. So after uh, the heat treat process, and you get them back, and you check mm -hmm. them, and you made them straight, then they head back to the you steel mean? area. Yeah. So back to uh, Sam. Yep. So basically, they will go back to the steel area. And Sam, you want to run with that for a minute? Uh, after they're done in the heat treat and I get them back, they go through the finish grind process. Um, so if it's a flat or saber or convex, it gets ground on an 80 or a 120 grit belt and then red scotch brighted to get the uh, bead blast off from after the heat treat. If it's a Scandi, it gets rejigged on the table. And we run through a 36, an 80, 120, a 320. And if it's a Genesis, it gets polished. So that's a, an extra belt, an oiled 600. And then those will get buffed and made sure that their paper, they'll cut paper before they go to be built. Yep. And then at that point, you are ready to hand them off to Mikey. Yep. Okay. All right, Mike. Mike. It is your turn, brother. All right, so I take the um, packets that we get from Sam, and they are usually broken out into groups of five or smaller sets, depending on what the order is. And we will fill up our trays with the knives and the corresponding scale materials. So if they're going to be green, black, natural, whatever, we'll lay all that out on the... Um, trays that we do and usually a tray will hold about 15 knives and we'll go through the process of drilling the holes through the scale material and marking the outside uh, shape of the handle and then once we've drilled all the holes in those 15 knives we'll take it over to the one of the band saws and we'll cut off a lot of the bulk material so we're approximately an eighth of an inch larger than the steel on the knife. Um, at that point in time, we will go through the process of what we call fronting, which is finishing the front portion of the knife uh, that faces the blade area. Um, because you cannot get in there with a machine after the fact to put the finish or the matte finish on it. Yes, as everyone is so gently uh, describing what the front is. Um, at that point in time, we will countersink the knives if it's getting fisheye bolts, or we will um, make sure that the pinholes are straight and even, and we will put dimple marks on the underside of the scale material so that the glue has additional pockets to settle into. Um, at that point in time, they go over to the glue table where we mix up our marine grade epoxy, apply it to the scales and the knife blank and the hardware and the laner tube, assemble it all together, clamp the edges, um, and if it's a pin knife, we also clamp in the middle, and then they will dry for 24 hours, at which point in time we cut off the excess hardware and pass them off to LT to get rough finished. Okay. Uh, we, did, we did skip one step in there. If, like Sam said before, if the knives did not get stamped and they would go to laser, they would go to Scott first. Scott, Scott what was your laser? Laser. Well, I, we can laser pre or post scale right. installation. It's obviously much easier with no scales can lay the blank flat on the machine deck. But uh, when I get some knives into laser, I will make sure, <laughs> do I do that every time? <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you do it for me, buddy. Every time they come in for laser, 
Oh, yes. We we have a question while you're talking about that. Doug McLean wanted to know what the advantages of laser hey, etch over stamping is. So if you could cover that while you're talking. Sure. Uh, so we'll, I, when I get a knife and I have to make sure that where the laser is going to go is very clean. So I will acetone it. Sometimes if it had oil on it to keep it from rusting because it was going to sit there for a day, I might even acetone and then go out and hit it with a scotch Brite belt acetone it again it's got to be very very clean <clears throat> i'll lay it out typically on the knives i will do them one at a time and the nice thing about our laser machine is that it will cut a little bit of everything <laughs> it will do paper it will do leather it will do etching steel it'll do glass micarta all kind of stuff so the first thing i would do like hopefully i would have five or ten at least of knives to do a certain model i'll lay a long strip of paper on the deck, I will zero the Z axis. It has an automatic setting for that I can, I can hit. And then I will turn the laser power down and I will cut the paper to see where the logo or whatever I'm etching is gonna hit. And then I'll move that out of the way, center up the knife, the portion of the knife that's gonna get lasered, re-Z the laser. <laughs> turn the power back up to where it should be and for our machine with the 100-watt uh, tube and etching a piece of steel is approximately 25%. And it's a Boss Laser 1623. I can't, can't remember the, na the model name. I don't the remember model, either. Model. It's, it's a it's pretty a nice machine. one. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty big. Uh, and so I will spray it with the metal etchant. It's like a spray can that is 10 Serum. times as much money as you'd pay for a parts <laughs> store. Because this yeah. can of spray paint is 100 bucks. Yeah. Sarah Mark. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. not cheap. Yep. Right. So I will spray stuff, that on there. a light coat, wait till it dries to a matte finish. That allows the laser and that paint to kind of burn into the metal. So once that's done, I can wipe that off. It's water soluble. I can either use water, just my hand or whatever, and see where I got it. And when it's a little cockeyed, then LT tells me. And then I go back and <laughs> refix my drawing and my lines and hit it again after I've scotch braided the old one off. Who one scotch braids it off? Uh, yeah, wait a minute. Who, whoever. I, I was confused there. He, uh, either one of my cronies who, or I uh, do it. They tell <laughs> he facilitates who, the scotch break process. Okay. Whoever. <laughs> and I don't remember that. I'll say uh, whoever. You okay. always say but, busy, wait, now we really didn't answer the gentleman's question. I'm, there. I'm about to. I'm about okay. To. I'm just checking. Right. One advantage to laser. laser etching is that if it's wrong, we can scotch bright it off there after a few minutes <laughs> or grind it and redo it pretty quickly. If for some reason the laser would come off during a different process, I can I can redo it. Speed is a big one because if I had a whole program written and had it accurately set, <coughs> I could laser on that machine, I don't know, 20 knives at once. I honestly don't know that I would hit all 20 in the exact right spot without some kind of jig, which I haven't made yet. But So typically one, one at a time is, is good. And then it only takes maybe, uh, depending on what I'm lasering, literally three seconds to a minute. Depends on the logo. Yeah. But the machine does go pretty fast. Well, I think one of the reasons that we decided to start heading that direction in addition to stamping was it, it gave us an option to do a lot more than, you know, than just stamp the knife. Well, yeah. I have been successful in just nabbing a picture or a logo or a word or something off the Internet, converting it through some software and, lay, and burning it onto a knife pretty yeah. quickly we, we did a run of uh not we actually have one left um if i could get elaine's attention let me see if i can do this yeah she doesn't see her out in the woods so yeah i know Damn. wait there she is in the past need a radio <laughs> sam turn your headlights off you're blind in your hand so um <laughs> but we, we we have done the blade we have lasered like a tiger stripe on the blade on the handle and on the sheet on those removable scale GMSs, those look yeah. really good. Also, I wanted to say a quick hello to a fellow knife maker. A couple of them on there. I see uh, Stan Maxwell's on there. Great knife hey. maker. Also, Scott Gossman, one of my dear friends, man. I hey, see Scott. Scott's on there. Hey, Scott. Good to see you, brother. And Nick, I don't know if you have 
if you can read this, but Doug McLean saying hi. I cannot, but hey, Doug. Yeah, I didn't think you were able to read those, so that's no, why. I'm I'm on my phone, so yeah, I don't have internet at my house actually, so just my phone for me. So if you guys want to see some cool knives, Gossman knives <laughs> and also Sam Maxwell knives, they both are great makers uh, and good friends of all of us actually. So Scott and I go back a number of years. Uh, we were both uh, skinny and good looking, right, Scott? <laughs> Well, at least he was. I was still, you know. I... And if you like knives, uh, I highly recommend Stan's uh, Instagram feed. He does a lot of cool things on there. <clears throat> very, very cool. He's making Good throwing stuff. stars now. I there saw that. Go. I saw that. So it's ninja. Do you do this yeah. when you ninja? Like, <clears throat> like laser ninja? He needs no. to be dressed up like Diamond Dave when he releases them. There you go. Okay. He's Diamond Dave. Right. Don't go ninja and I... nothing that don't need ninja. Ah. Oh, that's, right. that's right. All right, sorry about that. Anyway, um, where were we at on the laser? So anyway, right. Conversely, an advantage to the stamp is that it will be very hard after a long time to remove that stamp. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it'll in there never wear off. But yeah, that's for sure. Especially yes. once it's heat treated, uh, that's not coming off here really. Did we discuss it, it, the fact that the stamp moves some steel and we actually have to straighten <clears throat> that knife back out after? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that was on on Sammy's end of things. We did talk about that. Yes. <laughs> okay, so after um, they get through the build and Mikey's done with them, like he said, they kick up front to kind of where my section is and. We have some people that work with me up there, and what we do is after he's got it, they're in a roughed up situation. So they're just kind of rough cut. You got glue seeping out. The idea is we put the marine gray glue on there, and it's it's on there good, and it seeps out. So what we do is first is we square everything up to the proper size down against the tangs, and we try to get them near the thickness that we want to finish at. Because once they go past mm -hmm. me and Nick, they're done. So we <clears throat> them roughed down or squared up into a very close proper width. And after that, then I would take them and depending on what the material is, we will route a round over of a, the appropriate size, whether it be three eighths, half inch, quarter inch, uh, whatever we're using. And do the finish, well, I'm sorry, do the rough grinding with a 36 to get that the actual shape it depends on if it's um, if it's going to be contoured, if it's going to be slab sided, broomstick. So we'll, we'll get all of that worked out on the roughing side. And what we have sometimes we have some jigs made for certain parts of the handle. So what happens is Nick, we one once we get a prototype done and the customers are happy with it or we're happy with it, we will set up go no go gauges. And basically what they are is a piece of my card with slots cut in it that have words that say, this goes here, this goes here. Like right? this. The knife. To check. Exactly. So that we can gauge without using a set of micrometers <clears throat> at the time that we get the proper thickness throughout these places. Um, so especially on palm swell knives, it's important to get your fronts, your backs, and your centers the way you want them. So once I get those all roughed in, uh, what I will do is all the areas that are very hard to reach, we'll get these all shaped in exactly like we want them. We'll get this front 100% done. Because when Mikey puts the glue, Can't glues see. the handles on, the front's done. The front is done. So we're going to be working right here. And we're going to get that all taken care of. So in the rough end, that'll get done. And what I try to do is... I will get all of the steel down where it needs to be and then take, uh, get that down to a 120 grit. So when we hand it off to Nick's section where, where the finishing will handle, he doesn't have to spend a lot of time redoing that steel because that is a belt burner. Steel will suck the life out of your belts quick. So I try to use old stuff up and I try to get a lot of this steel work done for him. So when we hand it off, he does all the blend work back there. <clears throat> For the most part, that it gets, it, he doesn't have to spend a lot of time on the steel. More coffee, that, Sam. That's kind of uh -huh. what. More coffee. Oh, sorry. It's tea. You know actually. what, LT, let me throw yeah. something in there real quick. Yeah. I'm amazed that the belts do as good of a job as they do, and they come out as good because if you think about it, you're grinding and sanding a bunch of different hardnesses of material. You have a stainless bolt, a brass nut, 
in this instance, G10, which goes away right. way faster than those two, and some hardened steel. Right. If this was my Carta, there's a different one. It has G10 liners. There's all these different hardnesses. And to successfully roll the knife down and finish it and sand it, you have to constantly adjust pressure. There's a feel and an experience thing. Anyone who's taken a class will attest to this, that you could get little humps on the pins because the brass is a little harder than the micarta or vice versa. It's very, it's a challenge to do. But right. once you get the hang of it with the pressure and the speed of the belt, it's doable, obviously. We do it every day, but it's a little right. challenge. And, and we do do it, but Mick also has some secrets that he uses in the back to make sure that we don't have those <laughs> raising things. Of course too. he does. So. All right. First so, thing well, is run the machine as fast as it'll go. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, you got to get it going. You got to get it done. <laughs> you got to get it done. <laughs> quick. So, all right. So, so at, at, after that, after I've done all the steel and get it all <clears> what we call strapping, then I pretty much put them back in the bag and shoot them down to the other end of the shop where Nick takes over. Okay, so... <laughs> and that's that his secrets. Yeah, this is where the secrets... <laughs> so, so this is going to tell some secrets. You gotta this is where it. the magic happens, people. Let's see. So, at this point, once I take that packet from LT's area, those knives are 90% shaped as far as the handle goes. So I have a GNS here. This is Desert Ironwood with mosaic pins. If I got this knife from him, it would look like this. It would have these contours and swells, but it wouldn't be smooth like this or shiny. So this is actually, I don't know how well you can see, but this is a polished knife. Okay. You can see it. So that's polished. So that would be where I would take that. I would start with a 120 grit, and I tend to run my baiter at about... 30 RPMs or so, or 30, whatever the unit of measure is on there. I don't really remember off the top of my head. It's, but it's, it's pretty quick. Blow out the bearing fast and back off a quarter turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things. Uh, I, tend to I like always know when belts. you borrow my machine because it's way, way too high for me. But anyway. I, sharp, I do everything at that speed, basically, I know, including I sharpening. Do I don't know how you do that. So, um, so there's a step up. Uh, a process for polished knives, for matte knives, and then this is sort of a, uh, again, I don't know how well the lighting is, this yeah, is sort of a modified a mountain finish or a twist, yeah. So those are done the same way. So each one of those has its own set of processes for getting us to that end result. Uh, for a polished knife, I'll go over the entire thing with a 120, then a 320, and these are all flex weight belts. So if you're familiar with sanding material at all. The yellow ones. Right. These ones are very flexible. Like it feels more like a piece of fabric than a piece of paper, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's very, very flexible, e able to contour into these, these curves here, mm -hmm. like LT was saying, against the steel, and on the sides here. So you get those nice smooth curves and lines. Sorry. So for a polished knife, it's 120, then a 320, then a hard buff on a stitched wheel with a green polishing rouge, then a soft wheel, which is unstitched, same thing. Uh, now I change the direction as I'm buffing so that we don't get what we call pull marks or things like that in the handle material, depending on what it is, or in the brass. And sometimes even in the steel it, or whatever hardware we're using, you can get pull marks from those wheels. And then once that's done, that's usually polished. Now, there might be some back and forth in there where you, you know, polish it one time and see a scratch in some parts of it. It's kind of no notorious for getting scratches up here in the very front or here in the back. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, going back to your pull marks, the, yeah. import, the importance of changing directions while sanding. So uh, you're working yeah. like this. And what I do is I always add in a constant rotation. So I'll be working. If the belt is right here and I'm pushing up against it, I'll constantly be changing my angle because what happens is since the belt is two inches wide, if I change my angle like that, I won't get what we call a two-inch mark. And we talked about that in grinding, but you get it also right. in your handles. Because the same same problem still exists. The belt is only so wide. So if you keep going in the same area at the same exact 
speed and position, you're going to end up wearing it down. But another thing is, uh, like what, what I think one of the things <coughs> of, of sanding materials and getting that really nice finish that some of the guys like Scott Gossman and, and, and Stan will know this stuff is to change the direction on your grits. Because if I'm going to take a 36 and let's say I'm going this way the whole time on the 36 when I'm roughing it, if I can go this way on a 120, then I can right. immediately see if I miss that 36. That's one of the things. It's it's really yep. easy to see a miss deeper scratch. Because, man, right. one thing you don't want to do is take a polished desert ironwood over to the buffer and you're polishing it. And you look and you see a stray's 36 grit down there and you're like, son of a gun, I got to go back two grits to get it and then work my way back to polish. And so. it's not that you couldn't get a scratch like that out with a 320 or a finer grit. It's just going to take a ton more time. And what has a tendency to happen mm -hmm. is when you try to use a finer grit to get a deep scratch out of metal when compared to you know the rest of your handle, it'll wear that handle material down. So you end up with yep. raised hardware or raised steel. Because of the hardnesses. Yeah. Exactly. So it's better to step back and take that scratch out with the heavier grit and then go back over it again with the finer grit and then go back to polish. Right. You'll end up with a much more consistent no result. No cheating. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you try if you try to over polish a handle, you're I'm telling you what, you're just prolonging the pain because you have got to go back to the grinder. <laughs> That's paint. right. I was about to say, yeah, don't try to buff those out either because yeah. you'll end up with the same problem because, yeah. believe it or not, with the <clears throat> polishing rouge on there, those wheels are actually still removing material. So, like, you can take yes. a piece of desert ironwood and buff it to the point where the grain actually becomes raised. Yeah. So it feels almost mm -hmm. like a texturing then, but you're, you've taken away the softer material and you're ending, you know, you're left with this harder stuff and... Your hardware always gets Erosion. raised. Your yeah. steel gets raised. E yeah. Even with even within, like you said, in the desert ironwood, the soft and hardness structure of the desert ironwood, and, I, and yes. this will happen with maple too, tiger stripe maple. You can get raised in lower places, and that is a that is over buffing. Here, let me tell you something. When you take a knife this size to the buffer, and you're going to polish, if you are on that buffer for more than <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what size? Wait, oh, there we go. Wait, no, watch. This. Don't go I, into the grass, LT. I am going to stick it into the. Look at that. See that? Ooh. Bam, right through the hood now. <laughs> right? And. You're stronger like than you look. pulled buddy. into another dimension there. That's so cool. Uh, anyway, what was that saying, Nick? I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> oh, it's important. It's important. We have a question. Good. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. What the heck was I? <laughs> we'll, it'll come back to you. Joseph wants to know how we keep the rouge from staining the handle material when we're polishing. Oh, I don't know why. Wait, 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 wait. You'll you go can't. second. So, to answer your question very quickly, in a lot of instances, we don't or we can't. If it's a material that will stain from the rouge, we try not to use the rouge or. We use a neutral color one, like a white or a black, instead of a green. Sometimes, though, you don't realize the material is porous until it's too late, and then you have problems. <laughs> now, now, this is one of those secrets, because I can see you guys sitting there going, so if you're just changing the color of the ruse, then it's still going to leave marks on my stuff. Yes, but here's the beauty of that. Antler can take those colors, that black and that white, and you will never see it. Same thing with a light colored piece of, say, maple. It can take that light colored rouge and get into <clears> fine, <throat> fine places like you're saying, because you're right. If you use black or you use it green. It just emphasizes the grain then once you right. use it. Yeah. It just emphasizes the grain. Now, but that's still, you can't over buff it. No. You, you've no, got to be not over buff anything. No, all your work. The, every step that you go down through, that step before that was to make that next one faster for you and easier. So if I go off of my 320 to the buffer, if I'm mm -hmm. on that buffer more than 30 to 45 seconds on a knife, I have done something wrong. I'm telling you that right now. Right, Nick? Or you're using a really worn out belt. Yes. In which case, you're going to be taking a lot of steps back and forth. That's part of why I say I generally prefer fresher belts. With the few exceptions that some materials, it's better to use worn-out belts. So, like with G10, 
generally I prefer a slightly to pretty well used 320 belt when I'm working with that just because even though that material is really dense and hard mm -hmm. for sanding since it's fiberglass and resin it sands away very very quickly it's not very abrasion abrasion resistant whereas micarta which is actually a softer material sands a lot slower because it's denser you know it's like there's there's more structure to it again it's sort of like rebar and concrete except it's fabric and resin so there's yeah. more you know, mass and more structure there. Um, so it sounds not, a little not bit for slower. Me. I, I want a brand new 320, slow the machine down for G10, and then just watch the edge of the belt. Ain't you nobody work. got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that, that, that's the beauty of it because we we've each found a few different techniques. Like Nick has a tendency to shut his machine off and hand sand some where mine's going at 3,400 RPM all day long, and I just learn how to oil it, and they're less, it's a pressure thing. Especially yes. on the tails. I really recommend that for everyone, uh, is hand sanding the tails. Because not only is it round this way, but it's round this way, yeah. generally, yeah. for a lot yeah. of our knives. There's a reason there's a motor connected to the back of the pulley. Yeah, Turn that is. on. That's right. You don't, you don't. Nick, you don't hook up a horse <laughs> to your truck to pull it unless you have your truck on a trailer. Ow. 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 So I would feel real bad for that horse. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Nick was saying earlier about, oh, we were talking about overbuffing a little bit in the grain. Yeah, you were talking about overbuffing. <laughs> so what he was saying on that desert ironwood, even within desert ironwood, if you overbuff a piece of desert ironwood, it will get a... Structure to the the different hardness well, of the, the green. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Same thing. Same thing on meth, maple. You don't want to spend much time, and that goes for sharpening. When Scott talks about sharpening, he'll say, talk about same thing. You can. You do not want to spend much time on the buffer. That buffer should be your shortest amount of time on finishing handles. I mean, shortest amount of time. It's like get on it, get off. You're done. If you have done your other steps properly to get you to that point. Okay, yeah. so that would be for polish. So once it's right. buffed with the hard wheel and the soft wheel and that green rouge, which for a desert ironwood piece like this, I would use the green rouge. Um, but again, with more porous materials, you have to pay attention to that, be aware of it. It might mean that you have to do something like coat it with either a super glue or something like that. Then you can polish you know, other materials that are maybe more porous. Something to keep in mind. Um, but then, so for matte finishing, like this one, and again, I'm not sure. My picture is that yeah. big on there, so I'm just I'm Looks hoping good. that you can yeah, see it. Yeah, we can see it. Oh, All right, so matte finish is 120 and then we use a special Scotch-Brite wheel to give it a consistent matte finish. It's very smooth. It has a little bit of texture to it. The wheel is aggressive enough where it actually does remove a little bit of material, so you end up being able to sort of feel the texture of the micarta and that fabric underneath there a little bit if it's a canvas or a linen. Uh, if it's paper, it sort of takes on almost a brushed aluminum kind of look. Um, and same kind of si similar kind of thing with G10 except smoother. So, yeah. So that's matte finish. Very simple. One, you know, one belt, one wheel, ready to sharpen. Uh, same thing for twists and mountain finish. So, unless it's polished, you, we can do that. Uh, I have done it. I don't, I don't like to do it. It no. is, uh, it is, because the reason I say that is because for each one of these grooves on here, I have to get in there not with one grit but with two. Then I have to polish it with both wheels. And it, this one just happens to have my card of pins. But if it's got regular hardware, like our Loveless style bolts or fish eyes, those you got to make sure are absolutely 100% scratch free, or you're going to have to go back over it all again, basically. So Much more labor. Yep. Yeah. For, for a twist and a mountain finish, if you're familiar with that, the knives that we make that have that texturing on the handles, that's done with a small diameter wheel. And we just sort of set the handle. Let's pretend my finger is the wheel. For a twist, you just set it on there like that and move down the body of the knife. And I'll either add in a turn where I'm actually turning 
the knife against that wheel or little cuts like that. If it's mountain finish, it's just an offset pattern. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Now, and those are our three primary things, I think. I, I think if, if you guys have been <laughs> keeping score, you know the amount of belts that we go through. We start, when it comes to me, it hits the 36. Then it's either off to Nick for a 120 in scotch bright or a 120, 320 in poly. So again, we do not use a bunch of belts going down. I, I know makers that start at 30, 24, 36, 60, 80, 120. They go to 220, 320, 400, 600, then 600 oiled just to polish something. Well, that's right. one of those things. And I'm going to tell you right now, I used to use a lot of belts. I used to use a lot of different grips and, and stuff. But just doing it over and over. Same thing with polishing and polishing compound. We used a hard wheel, a soft wheel, and basically one compound, a green. But our green is a dry green, and we polish and sharpen with it. Right. So, so now we're and it's the same. It's the same kind of thing for when I'm sure Scott will tell you when it comes to sharpening. When I first started, we used three different belts for sharpening. Now we use one. Right. So now after Nick oh, right. is done, uh, they they generally get handed off to the sharpening section of the shop where Scott resides. So let him. We'll let him take over the sharpening process. Now that's assuming. Again, as we said earlier, he would do a lot of the split bolsters because we have the production team in place and we it's easier for Mikey to kick out one of those specialty knives and have Scott go over here and do that to, as to create a breakdown in his system. Because he this way he can still continue on with his system of building knives. So go ahead, Scott. For sure. <clears throat> if you th this knife is a good example, this even though it has liners. This would still be uh, like a production knife. Mikey and the team would do that knife because they have a, a special recipe for gluing the liners on and sanding things. If this knife had a divider right here and the beginning of this was blue and then this was orange and then it had the liners, that's something that I would put together over on my little workbench. And the first thing you have to do is build your scales and then make sure that you clock them correctly so that the lines line up. Uh, vice grip it to the blank, drill the holes. I drill one hole. This would be a great knife to start off with making bolsters on because I would drill the center hole first, put the scales on each side of the blank, and then clock it, you know, and make sure that the lines are going to line up. Uh, sometimes if the bolster is uh, 90 degrees perpendicular to the blank. That's relatively easy. If it's lined up top and bottom, no matter how much you sand down to the steel, it's probably going to still be lined up. That's a no-brainer. If you have a bolster, like the uh, sometimes we do a racing stripe with three colors, and it's on an angle, now when you sand this material down to meet the steel, your, your stripe is moving because it's on an angle. So now you have to almost sand the material away in that little spot to the steel to make sure that it, when you look at the top and the bottom, that the lines line up or, right. or it could be off. Yes, you in the front. So what Scott just said is actually can be used as an advanced finishing technique. Because let's say that you do that, that you have a knife that either has even a guard or a brass bolster or another you know, material bolster like what he's talking about where it's G10 and other micardos or whatever. Any material that has lines on a full tang knife like that. So let's say you fit those onto your knife blank and they are a little bit crooked one way or the other. When you're finishing, you can actually force that line to look like it's more, you know, parallel to the opposite side by sanding a little bit more and a little bit less on each side. A little so bit. A little bit. It, it yeah. takes a lot really, of practice. Really some fine tuning because there's not much wiggle room there. Right. So but it can you, be done a little bit. Yeah. It mm -hmm. can be done as not an optical illusion necessarily, but you are bringing those two things together by sanding at a little bit different, you know, level on each side. So yep. advanced mm -hmm. technique to keep in mind. Yep. So if you're going to try a bolster at home, do do a perpendicular one first, get a few of them nailed down, then do an angle. 
Yeah. And and then when you want to really kill yourself, <clears throat> do two of them. Do one in the tail and one in the front. <laughs> and, and and then do dovetails. Yeah, that's a whole nother. Yeah, dovetail or C and C shapes into it. All right. On. Yes. Yeah. Well, so far I've done a curve and that came out real good. Boy, we'll have to. Uh, if, I don't know any of these guys on the feed. I don't believe any of them have been through the advanced class where we actually have done the dovetail bolsters. Remember. Teach yep. you how to do them because bolster work is a completely. I, I mean, that's an, another skill set. It's not just it's like put these two pieces of brass on the front of this knife. No, because just like Scott said, if they're not indexed right, you might as well just throw them against the wall because they look like crap. I, I mean, it just it's horrible. It really very, takes away from the rest of the look of the knife the if they're not first, done well. The very first bolstered knife I did, I accidentally got it spot on. And I'm like, this is simple, LT. What's the big deal? Well, then the Whoops. next one I did, <laughs> yeah. I jacked that one up a little bit. Not so I had to redo it. Much. Yeah, it's very easy to screw up, but start with a perpendicular. But anyways, yeah, I would build the scales first, drill it, countersink it, uh, do the fronts. And typically, once the scales are built, it's like uh, any old scale set. I would probably hand it off to Mike or Tyler, and they will glue it up. Uh, right. Sometimes I'll glue them, but... Uh, they will typically glue it up. Okay, you, so now I got to... Well, but by that time, usually with the liners and everything, nothing can move. Exactly. I've yeah. already drilled the holes. You just glue it together. Yeah, you're just... I've it's already just, hopefully did this correctly, <laughs> and it just kind of goes right together. Yeah. Right. No big deal. All right, so now I got a bunch of knives, let's say, on the tray, and I'm going to go sharpen. That's the last step, typically, other than cleaning. But uh, So as I've said in previous videos, if the grind is good and it's down to 20 or 30 thousandths thick, that's the most important thing. Uh, consistency and the thickness of this edge. So if it gets a little dipped here and it's real thin and then thick and then thin again, now you have to rock the knife while you're sharpening it. That's a little challenging. If it is consistent, whether it's thick or thin, one angle, zip, zip. So I will do two passes on a platen, move it up a little on the machine, two passes on the slack, Typically, I will have my burr and make sure that you can see and feel the burr from the plunge line all the way out to the tip. That is very important. Once you have the burr, left or right, and typically if I all of a sudden the burr forms on one side, I'll do one more pass just to make sure I can move the burr at will just to know I got it. Then I'll go on to the buffing machine, which is edge down, buff once on each side with and without rouge. If you've taken the class, of a, I have explained that I put we put the same green rouge on the buffing wheel. When I take a pass, half of that wheel's rouge goes away. And then I do the other side, the other half goes away. Then I'll do one more pass. And I have no proof of this, but think of it in your head as when it has rouge, it's 1,500 grit. When I take the rouge off and now I'm down to just the wool and the, the felt wheel, now it might be 2,000 grit. So I'll take a pass on each side. Then I'll hit the soft wheel that does not have any stitching. And you wouldn't think it does anything. But I have experimented numerous times because if we can take a step out and speed this process, we're going to. That is a very important little process. It, it takes some of the rouge off from the other wheel. But it has it's just that last final little bit of polishing. And I have sliced through paper. They'll both cut paper. You can tell the knife that went on the soft wheel versus not because it'll go just a little bit easier. Yeah, no, I then, completely agree with that. And then this tip, most of the time, is not as sharp as it could be. And the last little step is hold your knife like this, take this finger and gently do this with it, and it should grab your finger just like a needle. If it doesn't, now we go run the spine. This one's a little beat up because it started some fires, but... Good. <laughs> That's the way you like to see them. You run the spine so that the tip gets hit and it's sharp, so that the spine is good for hitting a fire steel, and so you have some sort of finish on it. You can see that real good. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you can see the transition you between. You have like a finish mark. Yeah, transition line, yeah. And then it gets sent off to the cleaning table. <laughs> Every single knife that goes through the shop, this is, this is key. Let me throw this out there. Every single knife that goes through that shop, LT has shaped. Uh, Mikey has glued, Nick has probably rolled it down, Sammy has ground it, first of all, and then I have sharpened it. So 
we've all had a hand on your knife. Yeah. Now, everybody has a play, a play in this, of course, but if you say, if like, you know what, I'd like an LT right knife, but these are production knives. I, you know, I want LT to, LT handles every one. He has yeah. shaped that handle, right. every single one. I yeah, sharpen or, it at the end. Everyone gets paper checked from the fine folks at Uline that send all them catalogs. I love using their catalogs. They're yeah. three thousandths of an inch thick, that paper. If and, I can cut paper with it, she's good. Now, we're talking about 10,000 knives on the year. So these guys have handled, sharpened, yeah. paper checked, ground. 10,000. Yeah, that's pretty good <laughs> from a little company. And that, now remember, what was that? Wait, I didn't... 10, oh, this is... 10, Some of them even get laser. Every... Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey not, not bad for a small American-made company. Huh? That's right. I'm tickled to death every time I think about it. that, people, is why every morning when I get out of bed and my feet hit the floor, I put a smile on my face because I get to work with these guys, and that's a whole bunch of fun. Except for the last month, which, uh, <laughs> yeah. if, if you don't know, the state of Ohio has said that we can go back to work following some rules. We have all the guidelines written out, and this group right here is going to be back in the shop making knives on Monday, and we cannot be happier. I'm super excited, man. I'm, I'm almost thinking pizza day. Not kidding. Can't be pizza day on the first he day. He got me excited for nothing. <laughs> Wait a minute. No backsies. Wait, no yeah. backsies. Oh, oh, that's a pizza uh, day. Uh, oh, yeah, pizza yeah, now, yeah. Bob. Yes, you can yeah. have pizza on the first day. On the first well, day. No, you can no, have pizza you every day. wipe the box you off. Give with it the and then take it away. And then enjoy the pizza. I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, man, we have been... I've had fun doing these virtual life academies. Mikey, do you think we can just do them even when we're working? Yeah. What do you think? Sure. Are you guys interested in us? Like, we're going to all actually be together. We'll be six feet apart, though. Yeah. 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 I might still be out with my Jeep. I'll be on the lake. <laughs> yeah. Sam's like, hey, move out of the way. I don't know. What kind of kayak is that? Oh, look at that. Brown. <laughs> oh, geez. He's going to hey, tip hey. over. Sam, Sammy. Sam, come back. Breathe. Breathe. You don't have a snorkel, buddy. Eskimo roll. My question is, is that a spit bottle or a bottle of water? Yeah, don't answer that. Mm -hmm. That's water. Okay. I keep the other one closer to my person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. You drink lake I... water? No. No good, Sam. <laughs> There's a bottle there. See it? Somewhere yeah, that you have filled in the lake. I know. Uh, <laughs> I saw mm, hey, hey, here, here's what I'm thinking for next Friday. Okay, you guys, you guys that are still with us here. What if we have Mikey run the camera? We still do a live thing. We actually are doing a little bit of the parts that we just talked about and maybe do a little talking as we go through. And then we can all sit around the table six feet apart with our masks on and then uh, uh, finish out the show. I, I think that, that might be some fun. What do you think? We're, get, we're getting a we're bunch of yeses on the comments. Are we there you go. Right on. Okay. Well, well, uh, Rafi says her. yes. The baby say, okay, you do that. That's it. That's he it. Go, Daddy, you go work. <laughs> yeah, right on. Okay. Hey, man, this is a lot of fun. I'm going to have to go back here in the Jeep and see if I can pull that Toyota with the headlights on. Yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. He is so, I don't know about he is, that. He oh, is so hung up. And that battery must be dead by now because he's out on the lake over there. You know, it's, it's, look, he's on the <laughs> lake, left his headlights on. I know I'm going to have to tow that thing out of the woods. I can't. <laughs> Luckily, that brown Toyota is behind it, and you can push it. Right? Probably. Probably. Wow. Yeah. Hey, do you see yourself in, in Mikey's picture there, Scott? That's your head there behind there. What do you mean? That there on the hood. You're looking at Mike's truck. I, I, the picture's real small. Oh, I can't see it. That's from Arizona. Yes, I know that. I was on the trip. <laughs> oh, all of a sudden, he could see it, Mike. Did you see that? I can't a minute see ago? my <laughs> Oh, I was there. I, I don't see my head. I know what the picture's from. That's your head. Look at the size of that thing. Uh, Jesus. Yeah. Right. Full of sharpening knowledge. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. Hey, it's uh, about 12 after 1. Anybody have anything? Any other questions we didn't get to, Mikey? Uh, I think we covered them all. Hey, I see Bobby Plues on. Yep. What's up, Bobby? Hey, my How's man. Going, brother? Hope you're uh, doing well over there. Oh, he's down in Frederick now. Hope you're doing well down there. Keep making knives, brother. So we are, yeah, 
He's got knives of the round table. Uh, it's a square kitchen table, but eh, it's actually you know. a rectangle. It's a rectangle, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did I spell it wrong too? Yeah, I think well, so. <laughs> now that you mentioned nice. it, <laughs> all right. So we, we we covered everybody's questions today. I think so. All right, guys, stay safe. Uh, this this whole thing, this this COVID nineteen has definitely put a, a wrench in everybody's gear. It, it has uh, really done some things for us here at the shop, kind of put us on hold. But you know what? We are ready to go. We're going to make some stuff. And since you like us, maybe we'll just keep on figuring out how to throw you some stuff, some cool stuff from the shop on Fridays or something. You know, have Mikey come around. He's like a professional. Look, he made these squares. Mm-hmm. He's so talented. Two of them are rectangles. Are you done? <laughs> Why did you do that? Hey, you know Are you really sure like? I made them? Because the lines look pretty straight to me. Oh, geez. Oh, yeah, those well, are that's way too because he's holding the phone yeah. crooked. He's holding the phone. Hey, Sam? Yeah. Notice I'm in the big picture, you're in a small picture. Let's yeah, start. I know. Just, just, we did that on purpose to make you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it's been fun. <laughs> uh, hey, guys, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next Friday. God bless you, and have a great weekend. Bye. See ya. Bye.